Well, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to be here to share this time with you. And um, I hope you're all having a great Saturday morning so far. So I've been uh, invited to talk about the crucial role of technology in the new normal. And that's a really important topic to be talking about. And we all know that we have a reality where uh, that took a lot of us by surprise, where the world pretty much shut down over a period of time. And uh, we're not in full recovery yet. We're still in recovery. Uh, and some parts of the world remain shut down. Now, that's a very uh, interesting reality. And what we've mm -hmm. seen more and more is that technology has played an important role and is actually, we, we, we say digital transformation is the new normal. So I'm going to talk about this in two parts. First of all, I'll talk about you know, the role, the areas where technology is making a, a difference and how that can continue to be so. And then I'll talk about the role that each person can play in maximizing that. Because at the end of the day, technology is a tool. It's a means to an end. But we as human beings, we are the driver. It's up to us to take advantage of the tools and the opportunities that are provided to, get, uh, to, to create maximum impact and to achieve what our ambitions are. So in terms of the role that technology can play, I'll, I'll talk about you know, what I call the five C's. Connectedness, continuity, collaboration, capacity building, and competition. I'm going to elaborate on each of these. So the first is connectedness. Now, when you have a reality where the entire world shut down and we, we had lockdowns in many parts of the world, everybody would appreciate the fact that technology platforms actually gave us an opportunity to remain connected with one another. And where it was um, almost, it was pretty much impossible to um, move in the normal way that we do and have our normal uh, uh, interactions, et cetera, you know, using various uh, platforms just really make, made a difference in making sure that we were not cut off and completely in isolation from one another, that we were in the many, many ways we were, we were able to remain connected. So that's one important thing. And that's something that, um, you know, continues to be so. Now, the second bit is continuity. Obviously, there was an impact on businesses. And there was a reality, especially businesses that relied on human interaction. And some of you may run or be part of such businesses where, you know, for you to reach your customers and uh, for users to engage with you, there needs to be some physical interaction. Now, the new normal, the reality of the new normal is the fact that people just prefer less interaction. Even if there isn't a formal lockdown, people just prefer to stay safe and minimize interactions as much as possible because, you know, the COVID pandemic is still, you know, it's, it's still present. And so uh, online tools and digital tools have really played an important role in making sure that business continuity is established and businesses continue to run. So you, looking at uh, channels for customer engagement, like apps, like, uh, you know, online, online uh, stores and so on. And just, you know, th there was a, interestingly, an application for every, virtually every type of business and service. So for example, uh, education, uh, it was in a reality where it's just impossible almost for uh, children or students to get into campus, get into school. A lot of digital education platforms like um, uh, Google Classroom and a lot of other ones have really help to create a bridge. And if you're running uh, some form of either a formal learning institution or some form of learning organization, and, and you haven't already done so, it, it's really important to ensure that there are very clear, very accessible digital channels that can be leveraged to put out your curriculum, put out your content, and make sure that things continue to run. And there are so many options, there are so many different tools and platforms that can really make that possible. The third is um, collaboration. Now, a lot, of, a lot of the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is really reliant on people gathering together 
in, a, in the same location. So maybe you're working on a project or any other type of deliverable. You know, being able to get together, even teammates, office colleagues coming together to make things happen. But in the reality of the new normal, we're seeing less and less of that. And organizations are looking at, you know, uh, remote working, uh, flexible working hours as well, a lot more reliance on technology platforms. And those have really found, uh, it created a way. Let's take this um, conference as an example. This is an online conference. Normally, it would be an offline conference where we have the benefit of physical interaction. But by leveraging the, uh, the, this online platform, we're able to get the same content and get, uh, it's not exactly the same, but at least get a, a, quite a lot of value so that um, it isn't completely, everything is not completely lost. Like we can still have some form of business continuity. We saw even uh, services like fitness instructions go online uh, where uh, a lot of fitness instructors started to use um, Zoom or Google Meets or WhatsApp video, uh, different uh, tools and platforms to engage with customers. And that also really showed a lot of creativity on display. Uh, for some industries as well, we, we saw a boost in, um, uh, in performance, in productivity. So let's take the fashion world, for instance. Now, that's one that was, you know, really hit because people not going out. So there's a reality around, do I, do I really need uh, more outfits, et cetera? But if you look at the entire value chain within that industry, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of time spent by the, by the designer just really, you know, talking through options with customers, and that occupies a chunk of time. But now thinking about taking, leveraging technology and taking more things online, then you cut out a lot of that time where you just send some videos of, of styles and designs on, on different platforms to your customers, and then they can take their own time to think through it. And then you, know, you have a conversation and that's it. So um, in many ways, when we think about these transformations, there's actually a lot of benefits on the back of that. Home deliveries as well, um, you know, online stores. Um, we've, we've seen a, a, the increasing use of online channels for, um, for placing orders and um, uh, deliveries. Uh, banks and other organizations looking at apps and other online channels. And if you run a business um, or you're responsible for managing a business or, uh, you know, whatever, uh, uh, work you're responsible for, I think it's important um, that you do make sure that there is um, a, a digital way for, for customers to reach you, for you to connect with customers. Um, even post pandemic, it's very likely, and that's why we call this the new normal, this reality is, is likely to persist for a long time. And then um, there's, a, there's a reality around competition, which I would really uh, you know, call borderless competition, right? The fact that if you might, I give, an example, I give an example with fitness instruction. Now, if my fitness instructor is online, what that then means is that service is not limited by geography. Normally, if you're looking for a fitness instructor or a gym, you look for someone that can, can reach you, maybe that doesn't live very far from you, or a gym within your uh, environment. But if it's online, then it doesn't matter. My fitness instructor can be in London, it doesn't matter. And you are in that business as a service provider. It also means that your clientele doesn't have to be limited to the people within your environment. You can be in Lagos and have clients in Abuja, you know? And these are some of the opportunities because as we think through the changes, in some cases, the challenges, we should also think about the opportunities and how to leverage those opportunities. This is a big opportunity, right? Because now you can spread your net, you can cast your net really wide and reach people that ordinarily you wouldn't even dream of. And I've seen some clear examples of this already in motion. In the education space, so um, I saw a flyer <laughs> for uh, someone who offers tutorial sessions, you know, maths tutorial sessions, Yoruba uh, lessons, etc. And a, a friend of mine actually in the US engaged a Yoruba instructor in Lagos for his son. And also as a math, a, a, a math teacher from Nigeria, because really talent is talent ex exists globally and there's a lot of talent in this environment. So 
it's an invitation to also start to think outside the box and to think about, yes, we've been disrupted. Yes, it's been challenging and so on. But what are the opportunities that have been created? And how can I, with my own talents and capacity, position myself to take advantage of those opportunities? And the last bit I'll talk about, um, the, the last thing I'll talk about is capacity building, which is really around self-directed learning. We know that one of the beauties about digital is the fact that you can have access to virtually any information. It's right there at your fingertips. If you have a smartphone, if you have you know, any device that is connected online, it's, there's hardly anything that you'd be trying to do that hasn't been done before, right? It's very likely you'll find a template online. Say you're trying to create a business plan. You've never done it before. You'll probably find a, a how-to guide, a how-to video, a template, a webinar. There are many things you can find online to get you started so that you don't always have to start from scratch. You can leverage these tools to get ahead. So as we transition into the new normal, we need to realize that technology is no longer a nice to have or it's not, and it's no longer optional. If you're one of those who shy away from technology for one reason or the other, maybe you feel it's, it's complicated, I don't really understand it, I'm not a techie person, well, it's not an option anymore. And it's important to be very deliberate about uh, you know, finding uh, ways to really build your, your capacity and make sure that that's an integral part of what you do. And then just finally, the other part I want to talk about is the role that we need to play to be able to take advantage of these realities. And the first is just really um, what I call clarity of vision and purpose. The last year has been very unsettling. A lot of people have lost their way. A lot of people have been disrupted in a way that they're struggling to recover from. Some people have found themselves just rolling from one day to the next, like the structures that we're used to have all been shaken. The ground moved on the shifted under from beneath us. But one thing, when you look at people that have thrived or are thriving through this, one thing that just really helps is having that clarity of vision and purpose to look. It's been a good time to just re reflect on what's really important to me. What do I want my life to be about? And having that picture very clear, keeping that vision alive, because that encourages you, that gives you the energy, in spite of the challenges, that gives you the energy to continue to go for it, to continue to push forward, to look for those tools, the tools I just talked about, uh, which of those tools can be helpful for uh, getting you there. And I do talk about this, um, you know, some questions you can ask yourself to really connect with your purpose uh, in, in um, uh, the book just published called 30 Days of Excellence. And I've offered some complimentary copies uh, 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 through the Vantage Forum and the Elevation Church to um, members. Um, the second is al also just looking at how we uh, uh, move ourselves from where we are to where we're aspiring to get to. So when you have that clarity of purpose and, and, and a clear vision, then a plan to, uh, to, to help get there. It can be a personal goal or something around how we want to grow our businesses. How do we then apply ourselves and the resources available to us? How do we leverage our time? Time is something that people have also complained about over this period because in the past, your time was very compartmentalized. You went to work, you were able to focus on work. Then you come back home, you focus on and so on, you know? But now everything is meshed into your 24 hours. And quite often, you know, people complain of a lot of distractions. Like, you know, it, it's just hard. There's so many things pulling at you. It's all happening. It's hard to adjust. So again, being very deliberate about what do I want to use this time to achieve also ensures that we uh, structure and allocate our time a lot more effectively. Attitude in this period is something that is also critical. I always talk about the importance of having an attitude of gratitude. I think it's, it's key for us to think about, you know, what am I focusing on and what stories am I telling myself, right? Yes, there's a challenge, but it's a global challenge and everyone has been impacted in one way or the other, right? We can be very focused on all the negativities of the situation, or we can also have an attitude of gratitude where we look at how we've been incredibly blessed, even with all this, you know? First and foremost, the fact that we're healthy, <laughs> because this is a health crisis after all. The fact that we're healthy, that is enough to be grateful for and enough to forge us on, to say, yes, we're not going to be crushed by this, 
but we're going to remain, um, we're going to keep moving and remain up and make the best of it. And, um, and just mobilize our resources and make sure that you know, our thinking, uh, we're not limit, limiting ourselves with beliefs that bring us down, but we're thinking positively to charge us forward. So I'm going to pause there and uh, I'm happy to um, open up a discussion and uh, take questions. Wow, thank you so much, Juliet. Can we have some virtual claps for our speaker in the chat box? Wasn't that great? Thank you so much, Juliet. Thank you for giving us the different perspectives of this topic, which is, first of all, the five C's, very insightful, connectedness, continuity, collaboration, competition, and capacity building. And then also speaking about ourselves as well, and us, you know, kind of leading, leading ourselves. So my first question for you is this, you know, a lot of people are intimidated by technology. And like you said, it's taking over our lives, right? Whether we like it or not. What is a good starting point for somebody who finds technology to be quite intimidating, but wants to go in this digital way that you're speaking about, right? So whether it's in their career or their business, do you have any tips for somebody who finds technology to be very scary? Any tips yes. on embarking on the digital way? Sure, absolutely. I think it's important to proceed in steps. So first of all, there are so many tools that are available, available online. So the first thing you want to do is even just know how to use the internet. Now, um, this may be rather basic for, for a lot of people, um, but it's a very important, but if it's not to you, then that's a very important starting point. Just learn how to use the internet. And you can achieve that by see just somebody that you know who, say, who, who uh, seems to be ahead in terms of just using these tools, just spending 10 minutes with that person they will be able to show you, this is how you search for information. This is how you search for videos. This is how, that's a very important starting point. Then even the basic tasks. So, you know, creating an email account and, um, you know, sending mail and having that, uh, getting, getting uh, mail sent to you as well. That, those kinds of things boost, would boost your confidence. Getting on social platforms, social media platforms, where you then see, get access to, wow, a lot of content that is shared. Um, you start looking at, you know, uh, people that inspire you, that you want to follow, content that is engaging for you, and things like that. There are also uh, uh, different tools and uh, training platforms. We have a digital skills training initiative. And if you go on Google search and just type um, Google digital skills training, you get to a portal that has all kinds of material. There's a curriculum which you can also access from your mobile phone and even a basic feature phone that really takes you through step by step some of these, you know, how, how you can make technology work for you, some of these tools and platforms. Um, and, you know, at the end of the entire curriculum, you get a certificate. There are many other um, uh, resources that are available as well to just take you through those steps. So I've responded from a very basic perspective, which is where, which is the question. Thanks, Juliet. Okay, so the next question is this, what are the tools and options I can make of, I'm sorry, I can make use of if I'm in a consulting business? So I know that you spoke about the world being borderless now and how, you know, there, there are certain careers and businesses that really you can be doing business with anybody in the world. So somebody that runs a consulting business as an example, what kind of tips can you give that person about operating in this new normal in a borderless world? Absolutely. So I think, um, it, it, first of all, it's just the, the opportunity has expanded, right? And just uh, uh, um, operating from that vantage point. So uh, looking at what are my service offerings and how can that, what parts of this actually are very uh, location specific and, and, and what parts can actually be applied anywhere across board. And, um, and being very deliberate about, you know, pushing those out. So that's one. And then in terms of tools, you know, there are uh, what I've found, and I've actually been a uh, I've been on on the receiving end of this as well. Um, a lot of concepts, a lot. There are lots of white papers. There are lots of um, reports. There are lots of statistical um, sites, right? That have a lot of information that can help create robustness around whatever project you're working on. So, as a consultant, right? Uh, you know, you want you want you want you need data. You need to be able to look at trends. You need to be able to look at um, best practices and all those kinds of things. And 
Um, while some of that come, come with experience, you can actually, there's a lot right, by going online to search for information, there's a lot that you can um, uh, find to give you a head start and to just expand your offering, provide more robustness around your, um, your pitch, your report, um, and uh, you know, what your communication. Thank you. Okay, one of the highlights you mentioned is collaboration. Do you have any tool designed for local use that entrepreneurs can use to collaborate or find co-founders or find employees? Do you have anything, anything that you can suggest for that? Yeah, so the thing about these tools, a lot of them operate in the cloud, which means that they're just, uh, you know, it's centralized storage and they can be ac accessed from anywhere. And so they don't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, where they're created is not really an issue. They're, they're uh, accessible across board. So uh, there, there are a number, there's, there's, there are things like Microsoft Teams, there's Google Enterprise Solutions. Um, you have uh, um, so many different, um, you know, there are different project management tools. Again, you know, um, rather than prescribing, I would actually, um, ev and this is something I use as well, just going online to just search uh, for some of these. So project management tools, um, even, um, you know, the, the tools around um, human uh, personnel management, payroll management, um, and uh, uh, different forms of uh, community building, uh, tools as well. So I would, uh, and, and in some cases, people have also leveraged um, social media platforms to create these collaborative networks that really bring like-minded people together to share information in a powerful way. So those are things that, um, uh, you know, these are some low-hanging fruits. Uh, some of these tools are, are free as well. And so it's just really being deliberate about what sort of um, uh, collaboration do I want and therefore uh, what's most accessible to me to create that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Juliet. Okay. Now the next question is this, how do you get over not wanting to sound repetitive or annoying <laughs> when promoting your products online? How can you continuously market in a non-intrusive way? That's a great question. I think it's important to think about value creation. Um, some people think that the way you get traction online is by posting, 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 right? And, and sometimes all those posts is just creating noise. It's just creating noise. So what's important is to look at what is the value I'm putting out? And we talk about content marketing as a very effective strategy. So say you're in the catering business, right? and you want a way to engage with customers online, you can think about, okay, I'm in the catering business, what value can I offer to people beyond the service, which is you know, you know, catering, uh, what can I offer people? Perhaps I can help with healthy recipes, right? Um, tips for nutritious foods. So those are things you can um, you know, post about. That's what we call content markets, marketing, where you're putting out content that people find useful you don't necessarily get paid for that. You're putting out it out freely, but it's a way of people connecting with you to see that they're getting value from you. And then when they have a need for your service, they would you will be top of mind, and it's very likely they'll reach out to you. The same thing if you're in the fit, fitness business, you may want to put out tips around how to stay fit, how easy, easy ways for you to ensure that you are um, exercising your your your. Um, your heart, some cardio, you know, easy to do cardio exercises, how to develop the discipline of working out, those types of things. So always come from the perspective of what is the value that I am creating? Put yourself in the, in the shoes of the person on the receiving end and see, is this going to be useful or is this just noise? Love that. What is the value I'm creating? So think about not just selling your product, but also creating value, right? For the people that might possibly want to buy your product. Thanks, Juliet. Okay, there has been, I'm sorry, okay. There has been volumetric challenges in the order of industrial and economic proceedings post pandemic. Ah, this, this um, question is a big English kind of question, Juliet. I hope you're taking notes. <laughs> What specific pointers backed up by data is available for growth propagation in the current climate? Did you get that? 
I think I did. Um, so uh, the, the question is about the various challenges in the industrial and economic space and yeah. uh, as a result of the pandemic. And so uh, any pointers available for uh, growth propagation in the climate? Yeah. I think it's a good question, um, actually. And I think, and yes, there is a lot of data. Um, some of it's important to look at the trends. So some of the data points that would be interesting would be, you know, the industries that have been most impacted by the pandemic and industries where there is a lot more opportunity. At the end of the day, the value of these um, uh, information sources would be how does that apply to me or how does that apply to my business? So, uh, so for example, if I do realize that um, you know, maybe I'm making, trying to make a choice between um, two directions that I want to go to. And I find out that actually there is an industry that is opening up as a result of the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? And that has growth potential. Then I'm likely to think more about, um, you know, if that's one of the two directions, perhaps I should lean more towards that. We know that um, the aviation industry, for example, has really suffered uh, as a result of the pandemic, even hotels and you know the hospitality industry, um, you know to some degree lifestyle um, uh, businesses as well. But on the other hand, we have um, growth in um, services that that lend themselves very nicely to um, uh, online deliveries. We've seen increased in even demand for online tutoring um, yeah. uh, and so on. So. Um, looking at, and these trends are, are, are available online. If we just go and, and, and search on, um, you know, like industrial, in, industrial trends as a result of the pandemic or growth industries in the new novel, mm -hmm. a lot of this information would come up and, um, and, and data points as well. And uh, those are useful in, in deciding how to chart our course. Thank you. Okay, so next question. How can we leverage technology to rural areas where internet connectivity is low or non-existent? So this infrastructure problem, what innovations exist to ensure that they are not locked out, especially in an area where in-person interaction has been reduced due to the pandemic? It's a really good question. And it's one that has been top of mind for a lot of us in the industry, because all the things that I'm talking about have a basic assumption and that is that you have access to the internet and where you have environments that do not have that then it's a it's a different um, ball game i think uh, we have to be re realistic and practical uh, first of all uh, the the north star the ultimate goal is to ensure that infrastructure there's connect that the, uh, um, there's infrastructure access um, more widely spread including rural areas that were able to have low cost um, uh, bandwidth for rural areas. And we've tr tried a, a number of things. Um, we've just made announce an announcement this week about Project Loon, which is an experiment we carried out around balloon powered internet, one of our innovative uh, projects. And the intention was low cost connectivity for rural areas. We've uh, pioneered uh, uh, things like TV white spaces and so on. So all of that is work in progress. and it's collaboration between the private sector and government. However, in the interim, we've got to be realistic. What is more readily available? What's the lowest hanging fruit, right? And we've seen cases of um, you know, um, a radio, radio technology being used to uh, propagate learning in more rural areas, right? Um, uh, you know, bringing people, people together. So unlike um, what we have, where you have your uh, personal and individualized access right at your fingertips. In those areas, you may need to foster more, uh, um, uh, you know, um, community-based learning solutions where you make that investment in, um, because it can't be widespread for everyone at the moment. So you make that investment in a hub and then people are able to feed into that. So it's just really looking at from where we are, what's the the next step that can get us somewhere. And then we build on that and we build on that. But definitely the North Star is to be able to expand connectivity at low cost to rural areas. Thank you. Okay. So someone says content marketing is indeed beneficial. However, it can be very expensive and tasking. So the question really is, 
is posting related content, um, can that be seen as not being original? And is that acceptable as marketing information? So I guess this is tied back to your point earlier yes. about creating value, yeah. Yes, it is actually very valid to do that as long as um, we give credits ap appropriately. So sometimes what you do, you don't have to create the content all the time from scratch. Sometimes you can just be like a conduit where you curate existing content that is useful. Again, if we're thinking about value creation, it is creating value because people may ordinarily not do the work to get access to that content, right? But you've done some work to curate the content and make it easily accessible to people. So, uh, so that is valid as well. And when we think talk about uh, content creation, especially when you're using platforms like social media, it's also worth noting, noting that you don't need huge production budgets. You know, the beauty about the online world today is you can be as scrappy and as low budget as possible. <laughs> Just recording a few seconds on your phone, you know, you can get very far by doing that. Right. Um, uh, just uh, typing text on your phone, a few quotes and uh, what is top of mind that is helpful, taking pictures on your phone and then posting. With, so it doesn't have to be. And we should ensure that actually the strategy does not lend itself to a lot of complexity and a lot of cost. But yes, it's very valid and it is done successfully to curate content from other people as well. But we should give appropriate credits. Great. So don't plagiarize. If you get it from somebody, give the person the credits. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Juliet. Okay, now to your book. Somebody has a very specific question. Very, very specific. How can one change their life in 30 days using your book? <laughs> Say 30 days of excellence, right? So this person wants to know, please. How can they change their life? <laughs> I love that question. So life is a constant process of growth and, and, and development. It's a constant process. The intention of 30 days is that we focus, right? And when you focus, whatever you focus on tends to expand. And when you focus, get yourself into a certain discipline, uh, build certain habits, that takes you far. But it doesn't mean after that 30 days, everything is fixed where, you know, it's a continuous process. The intention, so the, the pages are not dated. You have day one, day two, but you don't have dates. The intention is after 30 days, you um, you, you start again and just keep keep going. And uh, but but stepping back from that, right? The what the book shares is just core principles that are tried and tested that work in enhancing growth and success. Principles like um, just clarity of vision and purpose, because to live the life you want, you need to define it. Life does not happen by accident. It's not a series of random events. We have to be intentional about going for, defining what it is that we're after, what we want our lives to be about. And then that vision without a plan is like, is like hallucination or wishful thinking. You know, you do that and then you create a solid plan, right? And then you take the steps. Now you take those steps from an empowered perspective, which is where you know thinking about things like your belief systems come into play. Because I talk about two types of beliefs, limiting beliefs and empowering beliefs. Limiting beliefs are all the negative things that we tell ourselves about why things cannot work. I don't have a godfather, therefore I can never make it in business. I don't, um, I, I, I am not a good public speaker, therefore I can't make it in, in the media industry. I am female, therefore I can't find, I can't work in certain industries and so on and so forth, right? On and on it goes. And you all know that we have the, that voice, that constant voice in your head, uh, which sometimes can be a tool for beating yourself up or a tool for lifting you up. On the flip side, empowering beliefs are things that just really lift you up. So it's not about, you know, like self-deception <laughs> or just trying to be positive, positive thinking, positive thinking. We've got to be realistic. We've got to be practical. It's about looking at the reality of the situation and see if there's actually an empowering context to operate from. So for example, that belief that I don't have a godfather, therefore I can't succeed. You ask yourself, there are many people that have succeeded that don't have godfathers. So it's not a, it's actually not a fact, right? And there are people that have succeeded that had even more humble beginnings than what you have right now. So that's where you flip it into an empowering belief that um, Godfather or not, right? I, I've, 
I, I will succeed. I have what it takes to succeed. And I, you know, that sort of thing. So uh, these are the kinds of concepts that are covered and that you sort of immerse yourself in, in those 30 days to just really help you uh, operate from an empowered perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so some people are um, asking about where they can get the book. And I know that it's available on Roving, Roving Heights, right? Correct. Is Roving that Heights, okay. all those books, Latina books and on Amazon. Okay, great. So those are the places that the books are available. And Juliet has been kind enough to give us a few copies to give out um, at this event. What's going to happen is that you're going to receive an email. So the early birds, if you're an early bird, clap for yourself. You're going to get yourself a gift very soon. You're going to get an email from the Elevation Church and you will be informed about how to pick up your book from the church. So thank you so much, Juliet, for for um, giving us these copies. We really appreciate you. Okay, so next question. Hmm. Is technology always connected to internet connectivity? <laughs> so, um, uh, no. <laughs> and it just really depends on what perspective that you want to look at. Uh, there are many technologies around us. Um, your fridge is a piece of technology. <laughs> Um, your your TV is a piece of technology, your radio. So technology is very broad. And so the, the, the simple answer to that is no. And when we talk about leveraging technology tools, it's just really looking at um, for how do you automate whatever it is that is, is um, uh, top of mind for you or that you're working on, et cetera. How do you boost productivity by automating now, the beauty of the, where we are today, though, is that more and more things are getting connected. And there's a lot more power in that connectedness. So technology that stands alone, like your fridge, et cetera, it serves its purpose and that's it, right? But when you have, and more and more, we talk about the internet of things where even devices are getting connected. The beauty about uh, connectedness and why I talk so much about you know, digital is the fact that then your access is limitless. You have access to, if you're someone in, uh, um, in, in Ibadan, right? You have access to the same information and resources that someone else at Harvard or um, Stanford or wherever, whatever has access to. That is incredibly empowering and it creates a level playing field. So that's just the difference. And that's why you know, we talk a lot more about digital technology because it expands what is possible and available. Thank you. Okay, so for somebody who wants to embark on a digital transformation drive, um, whether you know it's personal or it's in their business, do you have any tips about how to proceed on digital transformation? Yes. Yes. So I'll say that um, there are four areas that you can look at. The first is, uh, and these are like key processes for any business. The first is um, how you uh, reach your customers, how customers engage with your product or service, right? So if you're embarking on digital transformation, you have to then make sure that you have digital channels. So for example, if you don't have an app, depending on the, the type of business, but you want to make sure that you have uh, either an online store, it could be one you create or you plug into existing ones. Like if you're a merchant, right? You can plug into um, existing platforms that aggregate merchants where you can put your goods and services, et cetera. Um, you can use their um, platforms that make it easy for you to create your own uh, e-commerce uh, uh, portal as well. So, um, or just you know, uh, build an app and so on. So what the first step is making sure that customers have a, a digital way of reaching you, of engaging with you. The second is your own internal um, uh, processes and workings, uh, ensuring that your staff are able to, the reality of today is they should be able to work remotely. So making sure that your internal processes allow that because um, you may be in a business where um, the internal processes make it impossible for people to have access to internal systems remotely, right? Yes, security is important and you need to look at that, but you also want to make sure that there's the right balance, that at least a subset of things that help people to be effective remotely is accessible to them, right? And ensuring that there are these um, collaboration tools that people can use, shared documents, uh, and, and a lot of these platforms 
uh, a lot of the popular platforms are very robust. So uh, Google Enterprise has all of this. You know, Microsoft uh, uh, Enterprise as well. A lot of these um, um, cloud packages are quite robust where you have email, you have shared documents, you have shared storage and so on. That's the second thing. The third thing is for you to look at your supply chain, depending on the type of business you, you're in, uh, look at your supply chain management and see, you know, what we experienced during the pandemic because a lot of supply chains broke <laughs> completely. People that were relying on imports from China, for example, and other parts of the world, uh, it, these things just just uh, couldn't function. I, I placed an order online and something that should have arrived in five days. Um, I didn't get it in a month. I had to cancel the order. This was right, you know, during the pandemic. And so you want to take another look at that and make sure that you have alternative, you diversify your supply chain and you also leverage technology as much as possible to create that connection between demand and supply. And then the fourth is your own employee development. People may not, you may not have the luxury like before to send people on a training where they are sitting in class, et cetera, but now there's so many learning management systems. You can have an employee development program that is totally online, right? And also ensure that you are retraining your employees and reskilling them. So uh, if I take a very basic example, uh, someone who was responsible for your event management and logistics, you may want to retrain the person to be very good at setting up webinars, right? Recording sessions, maybe even editing those sessions and so on, you know, because more and more you'll be doing those events online. So these are things that we need to be thinking about and adjust solving for to make sure that we are right on top of the trends. I always, uh, um, I always, I always say that, imagine there's a lockdown for one year. How will your business survive? Those things are the things that you should be thinking about doing now even if in phases. Just picture that the world was a lockdown for a whole year, how it will force you to think creatively and innovatively about what things need to be put in place. They don't all have to be in place on day one. You can have a phased approach, but we all have to be thinking along those lines. Wow, fantastic. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your speech. Thank you for answering our questions. Thanks for everything and thanks for the giveaways as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our time is up. Once again, if you have won a book package, you will receive an email. So say your prayers if you came in early and pray that you're one of those that will that will win. Let's give her some virtual claps again for being so amazing. Thank you so much, Juliet. Chini, over to you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.